Well, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, depending on what part of the country you're in. Welcome to today's session, the SOGC Fetal Health Surveillance Update, featuring the two authors of this clinical practice guideline, number 396, Dr. Bill Eman and Sharon Dorr, Doctorate of Nursing. I'm Chris Rokosh from Connect Medical Legal Experts, and I'll be your webinar host today. Everyone in the audience today may be able to claim continuing ed credits from their professional associations. So if you need support or assistance doing so or need a write-up or information about this webinar, don't hesitate to get in touch. We're happy to support you in that way. I'd like to take a moment now to introduce today's presenters. Some of the changes to interpartum management that have been outlined in this revised guideline will affect nursing standard of care, medical standard of care, expert analysis of medical legal matters, and the analysis of causation. So I think it's a fabulous opportunity to get to speak. These two assure me that the buck stops with them with issues and questions and comments surrounding this guideline um, are made. So please, they deserve our full attention and they are very open to your questions and comments. So a brief bio on both of them. Let me first of all introduce Sharon Doris. She'll be your first presenter this morning. Sharon is an associate clinical professor, professor at McMaster School of Nursing in the Department of OBGYN in Hamilton, Ontario. She educates students in graduate and neonatal nurse practitioner programs. She's also served as a president of the Canadian Association of Perinatal and Women's Health Nurses, CAP1, as many of us know it. And she's an SOG member of the Education Innovation Committee, a chair, co-chair in the ALARM course, Advance in Labor and Risk Management, and many other things. And she's also one of the authors of the guideline that we're going to discuss today. Our second presenter, Dr. Bill Eman received his medical degree at the University of Saskatchewan, and he's practiced family medicine in Nanaimo since 1978. He's a clinical associate professor in the Department of Family Practice at the Faculty of Medicine at UBC. In conjunction with the SOGC, he has served on the ALARM Committee. He's currently the Obstetrical Content Review Committee, the Family Physicians Advisory Committee, Guidelines and Management and Oversight, and as I said, also, an author, one of the authors of today's guideline number 396, which is the subject of our conversation. So I am now going to hand this over to Sharon for her presentation on SOGC guideline number 396. Thank you. Um, just to start, Bill is going to actually start the presentation and I'm going to jump in a little bit later on with some of the content. So I assume everyone can see the screen now. Is that correct? I can. So I'm hoping everyone else can. Yes. Okay. Yes. Bill, yes. I will turn it over to you to start sure. and we'll carry on from there. Okay. Well, thank you very much. And I appreciate, Chris, the introduction um, and uh, certainly appreciate everyone who's attending. Um, it's been a great pleasure to be part of this process of development of fetal surveillance. I was also involved in the 2007 guideline. And I think uh, we've made some substantial improvements and clarifications in this particular guideline. So we'll go ahead to the next slide, Sharon. So this, the, it took us three years to develop um, this guideline with com, uh, contribution from the interdisciplinary groups across the country, uh, looking at the latest information uh, in the world literature. And uh, I think we've, we have some, uh, I don't want to, I don't know how, it's okay to brag or not, but I think that we have clarified some of the things that actually some of the other guidelines have not been doing to make it easier for practitioners at the bedside. So what we're going to do is talk about some of the types of fetal surveillance that we, we use, um, the critical element of looking at the right method of surveillance for the patient involved, um, the impact of uterine artery, sort of uterine activity, which has been underestimated, um, and I think we've seen that over the years. So we've we've integrated that a lot more. Um, we're going to do, talk about the elements of how you do eye intermittent auscultation and electronic fetal monitoring, and uh, how you interpret it. And we'll talk about the classification and some of the actions and documentation that are so important um, in the program. Next slide, Sharon. All right, fetal surveillance. I think 
one of the elements that I think people don't emphasize enough is that when we talk about the surveillance, we're talking about the surveillance, we're not talking about the fetus. We have no idea how the fetus is doing. And we're looking at a whole bunch of things, everything from the mother's appreciation of her baby's well-being to the uterine activity, to all those other risk factors that she has and the fetus has. And then we're trying to interpret how that baby is in labor. And so whenever we classify the surveillance, we're classifying the surveillance, be it intermittent auscultation or EFM, we're not classifying the baby. And so in labor, we have an opportunity to assess a variety of features, including the mother's risk factors, her appreciation of the baby's well-being in labor. And then we look at the first of all, the environment for the baby, which is the uterine activity. And after all of that, we assess the fetal heart rate patterns. And then we have an interpretation, the best we have, of how the baby's doing. And we'll talk about a second on why we believe that matters. In the antepartum period, of course, this is a time where we hopefully don't have contractions, but we can actually do the same thing. Uh, what are the risk factors? What are the mother's appreciation or intuition about her baby, which is absolutely the most important thing? And if there's concerns about the progress of, uh, of her antenatal care, we will do something called a non-stress test, which is simply a, uh, a period of electronic fetal monitoring where we're looking for some features, um, including accelerations and some of the other essential elements of that fetal tracing. And we call it normal, at atypical or abnormal. And so then we move on uh, based on those uh, features. Okay. Well, I think I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this because it matters on all the other stuff we're talking about. Is does the heart rate, uh, can we interpret the baby's well being based on the heart rate? The fetus is an amazing creature. It has superpowers, as somebody likes to say, that we don't have as adults. So in, in, before labor starts, the baby is ox using oxygen and glucose to produce uh, energy, of course. And in fact, even without oxygen, the baby can produce energy, and that is an ends, ends up as lactic acid. So the baby has a whole bunch of ways of keeping itself well. Some of the features of a baby before it comes out has um, a special kind of hemoglobin that accepts oxygen and unloads it better than the mother does, and so it has a preferential ability to get that oxygen. And in addition to all of that, there's a whole bunch of uh, what's called autonomic responses controlled by a variety of receptors in the brain and in the upper part of the neck. And these elements will respond to physiologic changes to protect the baby in labor. So what are some of those things? If the baby has a sudden increase in its blood pressure or decrease in its blood pressure, maybe caused by cord compression, the baby responds by a change in the heart rate. And the reason it does that is that if it becomes hypertensive because of an arterial block, such as the umbilical arteries, it wants to protect its brain, so it slows its heart rate. If it becomes hypotensive because of whatever reason, a blocked venous return from the, uh, from the placenta, it increases its heart rate. And so we can interpret those kinds of pressure changes. The other cool thing is that it responds to oxygen and acid base status. So if a fetus is low in oxygen and develops a little component of acidosis, the chemoreceptors in the brain stem and the upper part of the neck and the uh, carotid bodies respond by two beautiful ways. One is that it increases peripheral uh, constriction of the arteries and centralizes its blood flow to the brain, the heart, and the adrenals. That's a good thing. It also has a direct effect on the heartbeat of the baby, and that will slow the heart rate a little bit. And what that does is it decreases the amount of oxygen that the heart needs, it saves the glycogen stores in the heart rate, and it, that way it protects the baby. It also makes the heart fill more and it can pump up as much blood as it was if it was a normal heart rate. All of those features are manifested by heart rate changes. And now, so instead of looking at trying to matter, look at patterns, we try to emphasize the physiology. So I hope that that's not too much for you, but it's a really important element of this, of this uh, uh, guideline. Okay, the next one. The other element that's a critical element is that all of our fetal surveillance techniques are screening tests. And as you all know, a screening test doesn't tell you've got anything. It tells you that it's reassuring 
you don't have something for an exam, and you only use a screening test appropriate for the chances of finding something. So if there's a risk to the fetus, will we use a more sensitive screening test called electronic fetal monitoring? If the chances of finding something are low, let's not use a too sensitive screening test. Let's use an appropriate screening test for that population. An example in medicine is a mammogram. You would never do a mammogram in a 20-year-old without symptoms because you're going to do more harm than good because you're going to find a whole bunch of false positives. Alternately, if she's 55 with a family history, a mammogram is a great study. It was a screening test and it is appropriate because if you find something, it may mean something. So for, that's how we think about uh, these two methods of, of, of fetal surveillance. We assess the risk factors and then we decide. Next slide. So we have two types, IA done properly by people who know what they're doing is a very intensive form of surveillance. It also has the advantage of a providing a one-to-one -one care for women in labor, which is so important. Electronic fetal monitoring is much more sensitive and unfortunately has a lot more false positives. But if there is a risk factor there, it may mean something more than, than it would be if there were no risk factors. Hence, that's how we determine what method we use. I believe that this is also one of the most important things of our new guideline, is that once we classify the IA, or intermittent auscultation, or EFM, then we interpret the fetal surveillance based in the bigger picture. Because we all know that some changes in the heart rate patterns happen towards the very end of labor when the fetus is crowning and almost out. And we say, that would classify as it, maybe if we were doing EFM as being an abnormal tracing, but we know the baby's gonna be out in two minutes. Well, we're not gonna do any magic, urgent forceps or, or a cesarean section in that case. Also, a marginal change in the fetal uh, pattern, such as in electronic fetal monitoring, is someone who's in very early labor may qualify as an atypical tracing. But in that situation, we would say that means more than somebody who has an atypical tracing close to delivery, which happens in 70% of normal labors. So that element is a crucial step before the response occurs. Then once we interpret in light of the bigger picture, we then respond. And that response it has to be as, uh, it, with, with using teamwork, so everyone on the team understands what's going on and communicating well. And that response may be to say, okay, we believe the baby's going to deliver in 20 minutes. We're not going to respond, although we're going to be ready if it doesn't charge. Or it will say we'll go ahead and do an assisted birth. Okay, next slide, Sharon. The other element of this is we've recognized that, in fact, 55% of normal labors assessed by EFM, and sometimes IA, have artifact contributed by the mother's heartbeat. And we have seen really unfortunate outcomes when people were thinking they were watching the baby, but in fact, we're picking up the mother's heartbeat. And that can happen with the Doppler. It can happen with the electronic fetal monitor. And so what we've emphasized is the importance of assessing maternal heart rate at the beginning of labor, throughout labor, depending on the risk factors, and then in especially in towards the end of labor, or whenever there's uncertainty or there's a sudden change in the fetal heart rate patterns. That is the essential element of this, this guideline. Next slide. So once again, I've already emphasized this. We choose the right method, bending on the risk factors involved. Unfortunately, intermittent auscultation requires a one-to-one -one care in labor and in sometimes in situations in hospitals, we all know sometimes the resources are not there. And although it's a much less optimal opportunity, sometimes EFM is used when the resources are unavailable to look after the woman one-to-one -one in labor. Um, we know that when we see an abnormal tracing, that has a very poor predictability of what the baby is like. They say that the worst combination of abnormal uh, complicated variables or, or late decelerations associated with even tachycardia, only about 50% of those babies, according to the literature, will be affected. So although it's all we got, yeah, it would be nice to know. As I mentioned, a screening test, once you have a positive screening test, it'd be nice to do a diagnostic test. Unfortunately, when it comes to obstetrics, the only diagnostic, true diagnostic, is to deliver the baby, unfortunately. There are some elements that we can look to 
if we have an abnormal tracing that might give us better information. And that is looking at the bigger picture, including whether there's moderate variability of the tracing, or if there's an acceleration that's either spontaneous or with scalp stimulation. Both of those are kind of reassuring features. The other element of this, of course, is that we discuss and we offer these interventions. We offer the fetal surveillance when dis full discussion with the woman. Uh, the SOGC has chosen the word woman to refer to the person who is pregnant. We understand that gender issues are important, but we're going to be using the word woman for the person who's pregnant. Next slide. So whenever a person comes in who's in labor, we assess what our risk factors are, and then we decide <coughs> whether the right uh, technique of surveillance is indicated. And I mentioned resources matter. You need to have if you're going to do IA, a person at the bedside uh, throughout labor. So um, there we've divided the indications um, for IA versus EFM into two groups. One, it's where it's recommended, and one is could consider. And once again, whenever we say it's recommended, it's a recommended, and then it's discussion with the person who's pregnant who has to make who has to agree to it. We all of this is done with full consent. And this list isn't complete, but we'll go through some of them and I'll emphasize some of the things that have changed. So if there are risk factors for the mother, we would say that the chances of abnormalities in labor that mean something with AFM matter more. And of course, hypertension, diabetes, if there's significant medical disease, one of the elements we emphasize too is if there's been any kind of a significant accident, especially if there's any trauma to the abdomen, we would recommend that those people are monitored for a minimum of four to six hours, looking for possible signs of what could be an abruption or otherwise trauma to the mother or the, or the fetus. I mentioned before, and I say this again, is that mother's perception of movements matters and we listen. And so women who have reduced, significant reduced movements, we would in the antepartum period, we would do a non-stress test. And interpartum, we would listen to them and maybe consider EFM until we're sure that everything's well. Antepartum bleeding matters, of course. The biggest one would be if there was a case of where the uterus is starting, I mean, the placenta is starting to separate from the uterus, such as a placenta abruption. Now, we consider EFM in the kind of situations where it depends we know that women who have a pre-pregnancy BMI of 35 have a slightly increased risk of the effects of uh, obesity. And we know obesity is an inflammatory condition. Women with obesity feel the baby less well than women who aren't. And so th those people in labor may have a higher risk of, of concerns that we aren't recognizing. However, not every woman at 35 BMI is the same. And if she's healthy, she's exercising, and she's otherwise fine, that may be not a concern. So consider is important. And of course, other factors, and these will, might add up. If she's smoking a lot, she's using substances, she may have not have adequate prenatal care. Those are some of the elements that would be, make us more concerned that we wanted more intensive surveillance technique. Going on to the uh, uh, elements of the fetal indications, if a fetus demonstrates abnormalities in the antepartum period, such it's not growing well, there's poor fluid as an indication of possible fetal compromise. One of the elements that we rely on now, especially in later pregnancy, for signs of placental dysfunction is the uh, vo volume of flow from the baby to the placenta, the uterine artery Doppler flow. And we know that if there's good flow throughout the baby's cardiac cycle, that tells us that the, likely the placenta is working better. So the uh, Dopplers are important, especially in preeclampsia where they might be impaired. We know that one a uterine, art, I'm sorry, umbilical artery has more likely compression. And so we've included that in this new guideline. And there's some good, re we could have good uh, uh, references for that. Low fluid, too much fluid as a sign that there's something going on maybe with the baby that we don't know. If, of course, if there's an abnormal biophysical profile, then you may know that that's a combination of features that is found on, on ultrasound and may or may not include a non-stress test, telling us that maybe the fetus is not as well as we would expect. If there's a significant fetal anomaly, 
Um, isoimmunization is where there is an antibody present in the mother that could be affecting the baby's hemoglobin by, by breaking some of its uh, hemoglobin down, such as an RH incompatibility. Multiple pregnancies, my goodness, they have a high risk in labor. And we now recognize when the cord is attached to the membranes and not into the center of the placenta, it's more likely to be compressed in labor. And so velamentous insertion is one of our new indications. And again, there's good literature to support this. The only other one was that multiple cords, we know that cords around the neck, nuchal cords, can cause changes in labor, but it's only when there's three or more that would be a concern. Okay, next one. And then um, these are interpartum changes. And of course, if a woman starts to bleed in labor, has a significant infection, choriamnionitis. Women who've had a previous cesarean section, we would recommend that they have continuous monitoring because the first sign of a uterine dehiscence or rupture is abnormal tracing um, that in fact can happen more than half an hour to an hour before the actual true. It sometimes happens suddenly, but sometimes for, for earlier. If there's ruptured membranes for a duration greater than 24 hours because of the risk of infection, we would, consider, we would recommend that. Um, combined spinal analgesia tends to cause more changes in blood pressure for the mother and may charge uh, concerns with the fetus anytime we use oxytocin. In fact, of all the indications for EFM, oxytocin use is probably the strongest based on the literature, and so we would obviously use it there. And babies that are beyond 42 weeks have a higher incidence of, of concerns throughout labor, and so we would recommend that. Labor dystocia means labor that's not pro progressing normally. And of course, then we would have to be concerned that that longer labor, be it either in the first stage of labor or after she's pushing, might be compromising the fetal status. One of the elements that we're really proud of is <laughs> introducing the importance of uterine activity in any form of tachycystole. And we'll talk about that in a minute. will compromise the ability of the fetus to reoxygenate itself and therefore progressively will become compromised. Anytime you can't hear the heartbeat um, with IA, you should go to something more intensive. And if there's abnormalities of eye intermittent auscultation. We've clarified the prematurity in the old guideline. There was some ambiguity about the, this, but now we reckon any preterm baby for lots of reasons under 37 weeks should have EFM because of their increased risk. In fact, preterm babies under 34 weeks especially, have a, if they have an abnormal tracing, it's, it's actually much more suggestive of compromise than a term baby. Meconium, we still recognize the importance of that being them, possibly a demonstration of a fetal stress in labor or before. And if the babies breach, there's much more chances of compromising of cord compression and therefore. We've confirmed uh, the fetal arrhythmia issue is that this is usually benign, but if you hear an irregular heart rhythm with IA, we want to clarify that with uh, EFM. So choosing a method, these are, these are some of the things that I've emphasized already. Any preterm baby should have EFM. Induction is, not, not, is done not infrequently, as Sharon probably knows more than anyone. Um, and when we do uh, what's called cervical ripening or making the cervix more favorable for induction, the method used, um, once, it's, uh, once it's effective, um, then they don't necessarily need to go on to EFM if they're not using oxytocin. So if someone has a, um, uh, one of the prostaglandin inserts or even a Foley bulb uh, uh, cervical ripening and they go into labor on their own, they can have the fetal surveillance that would be indicated with other reasons. Next. Um, all right, well, th this em emphasizes what I've already said. First of all, the word about admission tracings. I, I, you know, because low risk women, we're talking about low risk, not with women with risk factors who should have an admission tracing, if you like, women without risk factors, if you put that very sensitive screening test on them in early labor, you will often find things that don't matter. And the Cochrane Review from two, about two or three years ago uh, actually suggested that by doing uh, EM admission tracings on low risk women might increase the risk of cesarean section by up to 20%. Now, there was another subsequent study that looked at that, and it really didn't say that they increased the risk of cesarean, but it did say that those women were much more likely to need to go on ongoing EFM, which in this table next to it, you'll see is not necessarily that a good thing, is that we know 
that if you randomized all women, including those with risk factors, to either EFM in labor or IA in labor, a lot more interventions are done, including cesarean section and assisted births. There is a slight reduction in neonatal seizures in all comers, but when they looked at this, the women that had the babies with neonatal seizures were ones that were oxytocin was used or they had significant risk factors. So the bottom line is, is that if we have the resources and, and we, we should be offering to low risk women intermittent auscultation to be a s intensive surveillance that is su suitable to their risk factors. Okay, there, I'll turn that over now to Sharon. You've heard enough from me. All right, I'll have a go at this now and give Bill a break. I think one of the things we've pointed out with that last slide is there are good statistics to demonstrate what we should be doing in terms of EFM or IA. What we do know is that a lot of people, in spite of those statistics, um, in spite of knowing that information, still tend to default to something that they either consider to be better technology, much more fun, uh, more current, more relevant, and they use um, EFM when it is not necessary. So they don't pay as much attention to the results of the studies as we think would be relevant for them to do. And um, so the reality is that EFM is used unnecessarily and increasing interventions when it doesn't need to be. So <clears throat> that's sort of our take home message from some of those Cochrane's and when you should choose a method appropriately. It is often challenging um, and must be done in collaboration with the woman and her family as necessary. So there needs to be discussion and clarification. And it is helpful to document that when you've had that discussion so you know you're appropriately using EFM. I'm now gonna go on and talk about some of the elements of the assessment that we do when we are looking at a woman in labor. And emphasizing again, this guideline is about intrapartum care. There is another guideline that is in the process of being developed on antenatal care. So again, we are talking about intrapartum care. One of the things we feel that you should do is look at uterine activity first because that is the environment of the fetus. That's where the fetus is existing. And therefore that environment is extremely important to help you interpret and respond according to the, the situation of the fetus. It's just like if it's a 90 degree day or a 30 degree day as it is here right now, or if it's um, eight degrees as it was in Calgary a few nights ago, um, those are going, you're going to respond differently in those circumstances. So the environment of the baby is an important consideration. And what you look at is the frequency of the uterine activity, and we ask you to document that as the number in a 10 minute window. Historically, people have documented, and this was well detailed in my brain. I could almost do it rotely, you know, Q two to three minutes times 30 to 50 seconds. And when you flip out and now start talking about the number in a 10 minute window, because that helps us better identify when there's a problem, it is a little bit different. And while some facilities have converted their documentation to that. Not all have, and we are encouraging them with this guideline to change their documentation strategy to talk about the number in a 10 minute window. Uh, we talk about the length of the contraction, the intensity of the contraction as mild, moderate, or strong, and that's based on palpation of the abdominal area where you're feeling the uterine musculature contracting and the resting tone as well by palpation. Now, we have also talked about tachycystole, and tachycystole used to be other terms. People would say excessive uterine activity, they would say hyperstimulation, any of those words. Those words are not to be used. We use the term tachycystole, which is still defined as any one of the following three bullets that you see here on the page. So if there's an excessive amount of contractions in a 10 minute window, and we say averaged over 30 minutes, and the reason we talk about averaging over 30 minutes, it contractions don't occur in a precise time schedule. So you may get four in one 10 minute period and then seven in the next 10 minute period. So it's important to look at averaging them. 
And if you're counting the number in a 10 minute window, you will then pick this up. So your documentation will reflect your concerns if any exist. Contractions lasting greater than 90 seconds or a resting period between contractions of less than 30 seconds. And the reason these three elements are there is they all reflect the uterine activity which decreases the blood flow and gas exchange to the fetus. I usually refer to it as the baby is holding his breath during this time period. So things that require the baby to hold its breath for longer or get less opportunity to reconnect with its oxygen supply means that that baby is going to struggle more. So any one of these can contribute to those conditions which will cause problems for the fetus. And some of the things we are looking at with TAC assist delete that we've changed in this guideline is if the fetal heart rate responds, as Bill has described earlier, with an atypical or an abnormal tracing early on, don't wait the 30 minutes. It means that fetal heart rate is telling us that baby already has a concern with the tachycystole and perhaps with other risk factors that the baby is coping with. If you are using IA and you experience tachycystole by palpation, then that defines the IA as abnormal. And we ask that you revert to EFM at that point simply because you need more information about what's going on with the baby and how that baby is responding to the situation of tachycystole. I'm going to go through the elements of intermittent auscultation and then I will discuss EFM. So starting with elements of IA or intermittent auscultation, again, as always, as we've stated, you start with contractions or uterine activity to describe the environment of the baby. And maternal heart rate is very important to document on a regular basis, and we'll talk about that, but we want you to differentiate the maternal versus the fetal heart rate and ensure that what you're listening to is indeed the maternal heart rate. When you're doing IA, you can determine a maternal heart rate by doing a pulse assessment of the mother, um, some people can put on an O2 saturation monitor, but the less intervention route is to just do a pulse assessment. The fetal heart rate, uh, you are looking at baseline, rhythm, accelerations, and decelerations. Some important things on the baseline heart rate is we want you to listen for a full 60 seconds. That verifies you truly have the baseline heart rate. There's no listening for 15 seconds and multiplying by four. You really need to listen for 60 seconds. And by the same token, the baseline heart rate that you might see a number depicted on a digital display does not reflect 60 seconds of monitoring. It is a point in time display and should not be used to define your baseline. A rhythm is a regular heart rate rhythm, implying that there are not missed or skipped beats. Accelerations are sometimes referred to as increases and decelerations are sometimes referred to as decreases. And one of the things with IA, you will hear that heart rate go down, but you are not able to determine the type of deceleration. So that leads you to wanting more information to better determine what's going on with the baby. And in that instance, you obviously would go to EFM. When you're classifying IA, you classify it either as normal or abnormal. There are only two categories with IA. And your action, based on what you've determined uh, so far and your classification, is that you will continue IA, you may initiate EFM, or you may even initiate intrauterine resuscitation, again, depending on what you've determined. Some of the changes for uh, IA for 2020. And you'll probably have noticed at this point that things that have changed are in red. So we're trying to make it easy for you to determine what the changes are. So when you see things written in red or preceded by red, that is usually a flag that that represents a 2020 change. So if a deceleration is heard post-contraction using IA, historically people would 
roll the mum over, maybe listen again, and then if it, they confirmed a deceleration, they would move to I, EFM. In fact, there are instances where you hear something so clearly, uh, you move directly to EFM. And we are saying that that is absolutely acceptable if that is what you're hearing, and the sooner you initiate the EFM in those concerning situations, the better. If EFM is indicated for an abnormal IA, it can be removed. One of the things we've often seen, I certainly see when I'm in L&D all the time, is that if somebody puts on EFM, it becomes crazy glue to the woman's belly. Uh, it is never to be removed because it's there forever and ever now. So what we have done is made it permissible if the woman does not have risk factors and the tracing is normal, usually after about 20 minutes of tracing assessment, that in fact you can remove it and go back to IA. Continue to monitor closely using intermittent auscultation and you may hear something again that requires EFM, but it does not mean that one instance of an abnormal IA requires continuous EFM for the rest of labor. And we put these times in very specifically so people will know when they can remove it safely and comfortably. One of the other things we are recommending is that people use handheld devices for IA. And that may be a Pinard, it may be a Dop Tone. There are different devices that are out there on the market. I don't recommend the Walmart uh, EFM monitor using a little stethoscope, but I would think a proper Dop Tone or a Pinard are fine. The reason we're saying don't use a handheld device um, or use a handheld device, pardon me, not the EFM transducer, is even if you turn the paper printing off, the monitor tracing is retained within the memory of the EFM hard drive. And this then is provided as a tracing that you have never seen. And people may think you should have responded based on that tracing, but you've actually never seen it. It's tucked away in the hard drive. And so we suggest use a handheld device. And there are some very excellent ones out there in terms of DOP tones that can be purchased. When to listen to the IA? Obviously, when you're establishing the baseline heart rate. You listen after a contraction to determine the fetal status after the event of a contraction. At any time there's a change in status, administration of medications, rupture of membranes. In other words, any intervention that might disrupt the fetal status, it's good to reassure yourself, mom, and anyone else that that baby is still well by listening to the fetal heart rate. The frequency of listening to IA is, remains the same as it was in the previous guideline. Every 15 to 30 minutes in active labor and in passive second stage. So when a woman is in second stage but is not pushing, that is termed passive second stage. When she moves to active second stage and she's actively pushing, we're checking the fetal heart rate every five minutes because active second stage is a time of much change for the, excuse me, for the fetus. And therefore we need to more closely monitor the fetal well-being by listening more frequently. This flow chart, and I give credit to Bill for his creative artistic ability in pulling this together, is a summary of how we look at intermittent auscultation. So if you go down the flow chart, starting with contractions, if we have less than or equal to five and 10 minutes, listening to the fetal heart rate, and the fetal heart rate is regular, and within a normal range, it is normal IA you'll notice accelerations are not required uh, to make it classified as normal. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. If, however, you assess your contractions or the fetal environment first, and you find you have a tachycystole, you have an abnormal IA. If your fetal heart rate is outside the normal parameters of a baseline, or the baseline rate is changing, if you hear a deceleration or an arrhythmia, it is an abnormal IA, and at that point you will go to intrauterine resuscitation and electronic fetal monitoring to better assess fetal well-being. IA cannot assess 
things that people talk about like baseline variability or type of deceleration. So when you get to EFM, that's when you're going to be able to determine those parameters. And again, as I mentioned earlier, if it's initiated and the tracing remains normal, usually for 20 minutes and there are no risk factors, IA may be resumed. So this flow chart represents a wonderful summary and a very succinct way to look at how we look at intermittent auscultation. I'm going to move on now to electronic fetal monitoring and go through some of the same characteristics, but for EFM. And again, systematic classification, interpretation and response. So first of all, as always, you assess the factors that represent the risks for mother and fetus. So what are the gestation? What are existing risk factors? What stage of labor are we at? Because as the example used earlier, if someone is in early labor versus about to deliver, it's going to change your response and concerns. Maternal status is important. Medications that are administered uh, and that may be given for a variety of reasons. So after you've determined what those risk factors are, looking at the uterine activity for the environment of the fetus, and again, when we're in EFM, that uterine activity can be determined by external fetal monitoring or by internal monitoring using, using an intrauterine pressure catheter. Maternal heart rate represents an important thing as always to continue to be, pay attention to, and you always want to ensure it's fetal, not maternal, that you are listening to. And again, when you're doing the EFM, you can determine a maternal heart rate by pulse assessment, by O2 saturation monitor, and depending on the equipment in your facility, the TOCO that is put on for uterine assessment can pick up the maternal heart rate and depict it on your tracing as a pattern synonymous at the same time as you're seeing the fetal heart rate. One of the things that has been raised as a concern by a number of authors is the looking at when the maternal and the fetal heart rate overlap, something called a coincidence or a coincidence alarm, your monitor will alarm and say, hey, these two heart rates are sort of looking the same. Make sure you know who you're monitoring. And that is an important thing to respond to and understand how to use your equipment to identify what is a maternal heart rate and what is a fetal heart rate. You're going to look at the heart rate pattern of the baby, and you're going to be looking at baseline, variability, accelerations, and decelerations. And then you are going to classify the tracing as normal, atypical, or abnormal. So in EFM, there are three levels of classification that is different from IA where there was only two. You interpret it in light of the clinical situation, and respond as always with communication and teamwork. Just to expand on some of those elements of the fetal heart rate, your baseline heart rate is looked at in a 10 minute segment where you can identify two minutes of baseline where there's no accelerations or decelerations or marked variability. Marked variability is when that heart rate is going nin, 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 like this. So it's excessive uh, change in the fetal heart rate. You can identify those two minutes. They don't have to be right beside each other. There can be one minute here and one minute there, but you need to be able to clearly see what that baseline is. If there is not two minutes of baseline you can use to determine that number, then the baseline is classified as indeterminate. Variability, I think we're, we're very used to looking at, but it's sometimes one of the most challenging things to actually write down and say, what is it? It's determined in a 10 minute window. Again, a window that has not got accelerations or decelerations. And you look at a one minute segment and you look at the difference in beats per minute from the top of the hill to the bottom of the valley or from peak to trough. And what's that difference in beats per minute? And there's very clear definitions of what terminology you use based on the change in beats per minute. 
It is not considered good variability. It's not considered poor variability. It's not considered in, you know, improving variability. You must remember to use the terminology as defined within the fetal heart rate guideline. And I will tell you, we have created a list, a definition page within the guideline that many of you have probably seen. And we would suggest that people actually print off that, which is an appendix to the guideline, so that we're clear on the terminology that people use. Um, accelerations are the same as always. Uh, they are 15 beats per minute times 15 seconds for a fetus that is greater than or equal to 32 weeks gestation. And if it's a little tiny munchkin less than 32 weeks, it's 10 beats per minute times 10, 10 seconds. And some of the terminology and definitions we've added to the guideline are use words like prolonged, abrupt, baseline change associated with accelerations. When we look at decelerations, a very important consideration, we look at two things. We look at the slope of the deceleration and we look at the timing with contractions. That helps us define the kind of deceleration we have. And adjectives we've used are episodic, gradual, and you can see them all listed here. And I think these are very important considerations to think about. Repetitive means more than or equal to three in a row. Non-repetitive, it's only one or two in a row. Uh, recurrent, and this is often with decelerations where they occur more than 50% of uterine contractions in a 20 minute window. And that 20 minute window or that timing is something we've added for this guideline. Because people used to say, well, 50% of contractions for how long? For three hours, for one hour? So we have added a very specific time to that, which is a 20 minute segment. More on all of those in a minute, but again, as I say, reference the guideline, you'll see the definitions there, and we hope that they are very clear and easy to understand in the table. How often to assess EFM? It remains the same for active labor and passive second stage, which is every 15 minutes. That's when we expect you to assess and document the results of your EFM. Obviously, if there was a concerning feature that came up on your tracing, you would not wait the 15 minutes to write about it or respond to it. What is new, and this has brought cheers from nurses across the country and midwives, is that in active second stage, you only need to document every 15 minutes. It historically was every five minutes in active second stage, and we found that, um, I can certainly speak for nurses, that this was beyond challenging by the time you were caring for the woman, supporting her in her active second stage, helping her to push, making sure the baby was well, getting all set up um, to do it every five minutes was challenging. So we have changed it to every 15 minutes as long as there is a caregiver continuously present in the room and the tracing that you have is an interpretable tracing. I will demonstrate what that means in just a minute. But if it's not interpretable, you have to go back to every five minutes and consider other interventions to improve the interpretation of the tracing. Uh, one of the things, again, these are some of the changes um, and probably a significant one. We love accelerations. Accelerations make us happy. We love to see them. But they are not necessary to classify a tracing as normal. And the presence of an acceleration does not make a tracing that is atypical or abnormal, doesn't turn it into a normal tracing. In other words, having an acceleration is not a panacea to make, say, everything is perfect. Um, they also are not necessary. If you don't see them in your tracing, you can still classify that tracing as normal. Decelerations. We still remain with the three broad categories of decelerations, the early, the variable, and the late, with late being broke, or variable being broken into uncomplicated and complicated. In other countries, there's other terminology sometimes used for these things, um, but early, variable, and late are pretty common terminologies that I think people are familiar with, and we continue to use those. And again, 
how to determine what's an early, what's a variable, and what's a late, look first at the slope of the deceleration. Is it abrupt or is it gradual? If it's abrupt, it is a variable. No if, and, buts, or whatevers, it's a variable. If it's gradual, it is either an early or a late, and then you need to look at the timing in relation to the contractions to determine if it's an early or a late, because that gives you information uh, with the contraction about possible causative factors. One of the things that, um, as we develop this guideline, we went through all the other international guidelines that were published at that time. We went back through all the literature we could find, and certainly old literature from New Zealand and Australia spoke to this, but there was recently a study done in the American Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology by Cahill that pointed out that deceleration is the most predictive pattern that we can look at. So the more times that fetal heart rate is in deceleration, the more we should be concerned. And when that's combined with tachycardia, it increases the significance of the potential morbidity and of the fetus. So when they looked at all the patterns that they studied, the time the heart rate is in deceleration at potentially combined with tachycardia remains significant. So we need to be attentive to that as we look at uh, decelerations and how long they're lasting. Again, this is a flow chart that is an excellent summary of some of the conditions around decelerations. So first of all, if you look at this slope, is it abrupt, less than 30 seconds, or gradual, greater than 30 seconds? So first of all, to go down the left-hand column, abrupt, so your deceleration goes down very quickly in less than 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. If it's very short, if it's less than 15 beats per minute, just lasting less than 15 seconds, you're probably looking at variability, not a deceleration. But if it is more than 15 beats per minute and lasting longer than 15 seconds, it is a variable deceleration. Now there are variable decelerations in two categories, uncomplicated and complicated. Characteristics uh, that differentiate these two, it tends to be uh, the impact of the cord compression, which is the usual cause of a variable deceleration, in a baby with good oxygen reserves, usually results in an uncomplicated variable. But if this baby has poor oxygen reserves and has some cord compression, again, being asked to hold its breath longer, but not having the reserves in there to respond to that, it becomes a complicated variable deceleration. There are four characteristics of variable decelerations that make them complicated. Failure to return to the baseline by the end of the contraction. And I'm going to show you an example of that in just a moment. And that is a very important feature to pay attention to. We have also uh, tried to clarify the timing and length of a variable deceleration using something that's called the rule of 60s. It's actually a very old rule, um, and I'm old, so I know it, um, but it is clearer and more precise than what was in the previous guideline. So a contraction that lasts greater than or equal to 60 seconds and goes down to less than 60 beats per minute or decreases by 60 beats per minute below the baseline is considered a complicated variable. Overshoots are ones where there's 15 beats per minute by 15 seconds, or by 20 seconds, sorry, 20 beats per minute by 20 seconds as it attempts to return to the baseline. And anything associated with a baseline abnormality, so absent or minimal variability, or tachycardia and bradycardia, is considered a complicated variable. So those are variable decelerations. If we now go to the right-hand part of this flow diagram, these are decelerations that are gradual in onset. So they have a very, very gradual slope that lasts 30 seconds to get down to the bottom or greater. It doesn't, they don't have to be really deep, 
but they are gradual. If that occurs coincident with the contraction, it is an early deceleration, usually considered due to head compression. If it is occurring after the onset, the peak, and the end of the contraction, it is a late deceleration attributable to chemoreceptor factors. Now here's an example of, on the left-hand side, a variable deceleration not returning to the baseline by the end of the contraction. And it has the same physiological significance as late decelerations. So remember I said you need to pay a lot of attention to that because that has a tremendous impact on the fetus. The one on the right-hand side is our large area of deceleration or the rule of 60s. And as I've mentioned, those are the criteria for the rule of 60s. This is probably the bane of most nurses' existence, the uninterpretable tracing. Um, what on earth is this? What is that fetal heart rate? What is the baseline? You absolutely have no idea. This is quite frequently seen in active second stage when it may be difficult for the electronic fetal monitor to continuously pick up that tracing. But what we want you to do if you see something like this is say, what did you do to make it better? Did you change the mom's position? Did you hand hold the devices to try and get a better recording of the fetal heart rate? Did you consider internal monitoring if it's available in your facility? What did you do to try and make this better? In other words, you don't guess at what the fetal heart rate is doing. You don't say, oh, well, I mean, if you're one minute and the head is crowning and about to deliver, that's one thing. But if you're getting this very early on with a head that's high in second stage or at any point during the labor, you do need to take action to demonstrate you've tried to improve this. Intrauterine resuscitation, a very important component of care as we try and correct any concerns that we see. Obviously, if there's a concern, one of the things that people will often do is remove the PGE2 gel or stop or decrease oxytocin. Um, this ability to either stop it completely or decrease the oxytocin is often based on facility guidelines and policies and procedures. Um, and it may be based uh, just on the degree of change that you're seeing or concern that you have or risk factors that are evident. And usually that is um, within the scope of nursing or midwifery practice to do that and then notify the care provider, the other care providers. You're gonna change the maternal position to left or right lateral. We've added check maternal vital signs, including differentiation of the maternal heart rate from the fetal heart rate, and you want to make sure that the mom is not hypotensive. If we're in active second stage, you may ask her to not push with the next contraction and determine how that impacts the fetal heart rate. Historically, people used to, and nurses were really good at this, the reflexes, meh, up the IV. Um, improve maternal hydration with an intravenous fluid bolus, only if indicated. So we don't want you doing that randomly and fluid overloading women. Remember, women already have increased fluid volume because of pregnancy, so we do not want to overload them, and you need to be aware of maternal fluid balance. You may also perform a vaginal examination because you may be suspecting cord prolapse, but that also helps you assess progress so that you can determine what is the next best action to take. Other components of intrauterine resuscitation are tocolysis, because in the presence of tachycystole, you're going to consider um, perhaps intravenous nitroglycerin. Sublingual is one that people use frequently. That's in the pump and you shake it up and you prime it and it's under the tongue um, and people use that but it has not been demonstrated in research trials to be as effective as using the intravenous nitroglycerin. And there are now packages that you can put together so that you can safely administer that intravenous nitroglycerin with the kit in front of you, the instructions in front of you uh, to make it relatively easy for a drug that we don't normally give in labor and delivery.
Depending on the resources in your facility, you may consider an amnio infusion in the presence of complicated variable decelerations. And this can work wonders to take the pressure off that cord and reduce those complicated variable decelerations. You always need to remember to provide supportive care for maternal anxiety that will reduce maternal catecholamine and the impact of that on the fetus. And one of the things that everyone loves doing is putting oxygen on. Oxygen is our miracle drug. We're just gonna put that oxygen on, everything's gonna be better. Not necessarily. We know that by putting oxygen on unnecessarily, you'll increase the free radicals and that will impact the fetus negatively. It should only be given when there is maternal hypoxia or maternal hypovolemia is suspected or confirmed. And for many people, that represents a change in practice. And it is something within a facility that should be discussed and resolved because there are often differences among caregivers because historically people so relied on being able to give oxygen as what's going to make everything better. If additional testing is required, um, because remember this is nothing more than a, a test that we look at that will give us screening information, so you might want to go on and do further testing. Fetal scalp stimulation, where you do a VAG exam and gently, gently, we're not removing hair, gently remove, uh, rub the baby's head. You do it when there's an uncertain tracing. It is not something that's done when you see a bradycardia to improve that. This is for assessment, not treatment. And if you do see that acceleration in the fetal heart rate, it usually represents a pH of 7.2, which should be reassuring. The other thing that you can do for additional testing is self scalp blood sampling either using a pH monitor or lactate, which is of course used extensively in British Columbia and been adopted increasingly across the country. It is well validated in Europe and in Australia, and uh, you only need a very small amount of blood, and it is a bedside test. The one that's approved by Health Canada is pictured here, the stat strip you can get a result within about 11 or 12 seconds compared to trying to do a pH result. I'm gonna talk about documentation now. Um, we have recommended that Canada move to a national paper speed of three centimeters a minute. As you are more than aware, there are different speeds currently across the country. Um, some areas have adopted the three centimeters a minute and have been there all along, whereas others have moved to it. Recently, one of the provinces moved directly to three centimeters a minute from their previous speed of two centimeters or one centimeter a minute. They had an educational program and they've successfully managed provincially to change to three centimeters a minute. Part of the rationale is this, it makes for common education. When individuals or caregivers move across the country, they're familiar with what that pattern looks like because when you look at a tracing, it's often pattern recognition that you're looking at. And at different speeds, that pattern looks different. So it's important that we're running at the same speed so we're all looking at the same kinds of patterns for more consistency in our education and teaching. There's also documentation out of Germany that demonstrates using a paper speed of three centimeters a minute makes it more interpretable to the caregiver and is somewhat more accurate in identifying patterns. Um, the rationale for the method of monitoring and discussion, as Bill mentioned, should be cleared with the woman in terms of describing to her why you're doing this and you should document that in your narrative charting. Writing on the tracing is okay. It can be done particularly to flag key events. We've all looked at tracings when we're trying to figure out, so when did they do that VAG exam that would have put the mom on her back and maybe altered the fetal heart rate? So it is useful to have some of those. And with um, the EMR systems, often there is a point and click system where you can put those records right on the monitor. And one of my favorite things is the timing on the trace and trace, tracing is consistent with narrative and flow sheet documentation. The clock in the room is different than the clock on the e EMR. 
and or different than the clock on the tracing. And therefore, you're trying to put the narrative notes together with the tracing. There are satellite clocks that are used to make sure everything is at the same time, but it is prudent for caregivers to think about looking at what is the clock on the monitor and is that in agreement with the clock on the wall or with your watch so that we're ensuring we have consistent documentation timing. So in summary, under uterine activity, you're documenting frequency, intensity, length, and resting tone. And those are the characteristics that you're looking for. Under the maternal and the fetal heart rate, you're looking at the maternal heart rate, your mode of monitoring, is it IA, EFM, EFM external, EFM internal, uh, the fetal heart components as determined by the mode of monitoring, the classification, the interpret interpretation, and interventions and actions, and other uh, documentation, whoops, that went away. Other documentation, your interpretation, your interventions, and communication with the healthcare team. I think of all of this, one of the things that I will stress is the classification under the fetal heart rate. Um, historically, nurses have thought, well, I can't write the classification as normal, atypical, or abnormal. Oh, yes, you can. And that should be part of the regular documentation on your flow sheet. So when we look at the flow sheet, we should have components that allow you to document contractions, maternal heart rate in beats per minute, the fetal heart rate, and all of these things under the fetal heart rate. So the baseline, it's an exact number if it's IA because you're counting for 60 seconds. And in EFM, it's a range rounded to five beats per minute. You're either doing rhythm or variability, and rhythm is regular or irregular, and variability using appropriate fetal heart rate terminology is either absent, minimal, moderate, or marked. Accelerations are present or absent, and decelerations or decreases with IA or with EFM are early, variable, complicated variable, late, and you may add descriptors to that as well, uh, such as prolonged or words such as that. The classification should be on your flow sheet or EMR as normal or abnormal, or normal, atypical or abnormal if you're using EFM, and what actions you took as a result of that. Sharon, can I just add one thing? Uh, yes, uh, of we've got the previous slide. I think that, uh, first of all, is that never is everything exactly as we find. There are always situations where, is it early, is it late? It could be, and so sometimes you're trying to make the best uh, judgment of what you're actually seeing. So first of all, it's not always 100% clear, and that really goes to like any kind of picture like this. And the other thing is, is that, the, it, it's okay to make a classification. In the past, classification meant response. Now we say classify, and you. But it doesn't mean you need to do a crash section. You interpret it light of the bigger picture, and that makes the caregiver more comfortable with classifying the tracing. And the other thing that I, one of the things that I really think is important is, tra as Sharon has said, it's a tracing. It's not a strip. It's not EFM, it is the tracing we are classifying. And that language is so important. And we've emphasized that in the guideline. I'll let it, turn it back to Sharon now. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. I think the point I was going to mention too is that we show you textbook pictures. And the guideline, contrary to all other international guidelines, actually has pictures of the tracing in it. But we have lovely pictures that are the perfect depiction of a variable deceleration reality and real life sometimes isn't as picture perfect as what we see in the textbooks. Um, so when we come to the section that Bill's going to give us on some case studies, hopefully that will depict that reality that we need to deal with on a regular basis. Now, are we any good at fetal health surveillance? You folks know this better than we do. We know there's lots of cases where there's concerns expressed and maybe we've either missed the mark or not responded in the way. It, we do our best. Remember, it's a screening test. We do our best to pick things up. But obviously, there are times when 
things don't turn out as well as we would hope. One of the things that has been demonstrated in the review done by HEROC and CMPA, and I'm sure you're familiar with this, is that interpartum fetal surveillance is the all-time winner as the item that was most associated with litigation and closely followed by induction and augmentation of labor. But it is an area of concern, um, so it is an area of risk uh, for all of us to try and do well. So what will increase, increase your chances of a good outcome? We suggest use of correct terminology in verbal and written communication and insisting your colleagues do it too. My classic example is that I've heard nurses say things like, can you, to a physician on the phone, can you come look at this tracing? I've got some dippity doos Well, I'm not quite sure what dippity doos are. So using proper terminology helps identify what your concern is and what the urgency of your concern is. Having open discussion with other members of the healthcare team. As Bill just mentioned, it's not classic pictures of decelerations and variability that we see all the time. So it's okay to say to colleagues standing beside you in central monitoring, can you help me with this? This is what I think it is. Do you see anything different than that? That is okay to do. Always, always look at the total clinical picture. And the other thing that will help all of us is regular education. As we speak about education in Australia, they have a national fetal health surveillance education program. And in 2016, they showed a significant reduction in outcomes, interpartum hypoxic death, poor APGAR scores, and rates of hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy without an increase in emergency cesarean sections by implementing this national program of education. In the UK, education is annual for all caregivers and they found improved participant reaction, learning, behavior change, and impact if they required education annually. What's the Canadian situation currently? The Canadian Association of Midwives requires fetal health surveillance every couple of years, two years. The Canadian Association of Perinatal and Women's Health Nurses has recommended it every two years. British Columbia individual facilities have required caregivers in interpartum care to have an educational certificate every two years to maintain privileges. Canada nationally, however, has not had a requirement for physician education, be that a family doctor or an obstetrician, and nor did it have a national requirement for collaborative education. We are working as a team. Interpartum care is about teamwork, and therefore, if we learn together, we know how each other's will respond and we're learning the same content. So our recommendation from the 2020 guideline is that all providers of interpartum obstetrical care, physicians, nurses, and midwives should be required to commit to formal education in fetal health surveillance and pain, maintain up-to-date competence with a formal education review every two years. And the fundamentals of fetal health surveillance through UBC provides a self-learning online manual that is being updated to reflect the 2020 guidelines. And following the review of that online material, we are recommending attendance at an interprofessional workshop where people have an opportunity to review cases that they have experienced both IA and EFM and talk in a multidisciplinary fashion about expected responses, um, about what they see, how they view it, how they document it. And this helps us all learn as a group. Now, that is a very quick summary between Bill and I of the 2020 guidelines. I have one question that's quite pertinent to documentation, which you just kind of wrapped up with there, Sharon. So perhaps I'll just ask one. Um, the first, it comes from an experienced perinatal nurse and clinical educator. Her question is, what are your thoughts on documenting and assessing uterine activity every 30 minutes versus every 15 minutes when you're interpreting the FH? Was this guideline meant to be interpreted that way because she's recently started instructing her staff to document every 30 minutes on uterine activity? Well, one of the, the concerns that we need to think about is remember, if you have a deceleration, you need to know the uterine activity pattern 
and you establish that heart weight and the environment of the fetus relative to the environment of the fetus. So I, I think what we're looking at is fetal health surveillance involves both uterine activity and fetal heart rate. Um, you know, I think if people are using flow sheets or EMR, uh, it's a very quick means of documentation, and I would be hesitant to separate the documentation of the fetal heart rate every 15 minutes and the uterine activity every 30 minutes. Now, um, I think if you are only doing the IA every 30 minutes, then that's what you're doing. But if you're doing fetal health surveillance every 15 minutes, that's what it is. Bill, do you, would you like to weigh in on that? Well, the only thing is, is that we do say that the uterine activity is measured at, on average over 30 minutes. So it would be sort of what your impression at that time is of the fetal, of the heart rate patterns at that 15 minute mark, but over having looked at it over 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. If you're interested in more medical legal learning, well, first of all, I'd love some feedback. This is the first time that we have done a webinar like this with a combination of medical and legal audience and medical expertise as a speaker. And um, I happen to know a couple doctors and nurses. So if you have more um, interest in education you'd like to hear, I'm certainly happy to organize webinars in the future. Also, if you're interested in more medical legal learning, um, we have a new podcast called Inside Medical Malpractice. And it's available on Apple, Spotify, Google, YouTube, and our website at Connect Experts. We just found out this week that it's hit the top 50% of all podcasts, which we're very, very excited about. And we've got some great, great guests coming up in the future. Today, we'll be releasing Gary Well from Well Davidson Law Firm in Toronto talking about the COVID-19 class action against the Orchard Villa Retirement Center in Pickering, Ontario. Next up, um, on September 15th, we'll be, release, we'll be releasing a podcast by this Dr. Daniel Ofri, who's written a fascinating book called When We Do Harm, which is a doctor's perspective of adverse events and medical malpractice. It's just fantastic read. And she was a super, she was a, a great guest to interview. And then on October 15th, I'm very fortunate to have retired Chief Justice Beverly McLaughlin talking about her book, her autobiography, autobiography called Truth Be Told. We'll be discussing the Supreme Court of Canada Snell versus Farrell decision. We'll be talking about her journey to the Supreme Court and Chief Justice role as a woman. And like, um, this webinar, we've checked with legal and medical and nursing associations, and you are likely able to claim continuing ed hours for listening into the podcast. So we have some questions. We had a couple audience members talk about the global definition of tachycystole used in guideline 396, which seems to replace words like coupling, tripling, tetany, tone. Can you discuss that with us, that change in definition? Sharon, do you want me to do that? or? Okay, well, I, I think that the important thing about tachycystole is that what is the physiologic problem with tachycystole to the fetus? Anytime that you have too long, too many, an unre unrelaxing uterus, it causes, as I mentioned, a progressive asphyxia or progressive oxygenation deficit for the fetus. And in the past, there's been huge confusion on the words. I've got a hyperstimulation. Well, what does that mean to a doctor in bed at night called by the nurses? I don't know. Tell me what that means. Um, or, you know, and if it was a long contraction, that means physiologically the same to the baby as too many contractions because it's that relaxation between contractions that matters. And so if I get a call at home in the middle of the night and I have a tachycystole with a normal tracing, I'll say, and whether it's too long or too many or not relaxing, I'll say, well, what are you doing? But if I get a call ting, I've got tachycystole with an abnormal tracing, I'm on my way. The communication is much better to, so, and I understand that it's hard to get your name around things, but language changes, language evolves. And I think what we've done now is we've clarified the term for what it means for the fetus. And I just add, Bill, I, the very clear explanation. I think just realizing that baby is holding its breath and that baby's response depends on its oxygen reserves. So while it may cope with a tachycystole for a short period of time, because it has good oxygen reserves, the baby who has less adequate oxygen reserves 
perhaps as identified by an IUGR baby or decreased placental function, is not able to withstand that tachycystole for as long before the heart rate starts to deteriorate and show signs of concern. And so if we just cluster that and think of it as baby's holding its breath, how long can this baby hold its breath based on what we know about the baby risk factors and the fetal maternal status, we need to think about that as well. Can I just add one of the things that we've brought in this guideline is the importance of considering IA as a package of care. IA is, assumes doing risk factor assessment, doing environmental assessment, assessing the uterine activity, contractions, and then listen to the baby's heartbeat. It is a package. And in, we're the only guideline, I think, in the world now that has brought that essential element because in the past, a normal IH simply meant a normal heartbeat. And that could not be necessarily a healthy baby at the time. That baby might be struggling with having accelerations after, uh, after a deceleration. And so I, I think we have done, I think, a really good service for our caregivers to include contraction patterns in the IA assessment. I think that relates to the question earlier too. Fetal health surveillance is a package. It's not just a heart rate. Thank you, and great answer. I want to ask a question of my own in the midst of all this, and you answered it in part a minute ago, but one of the um, recommendations around classification and interpretation in this guideline talks a lot about the um, clinical picture and the resultant clinical response is to place greater emphasis on the overall clinical picture. Can you give us a little discussion around that so that everybody understands what that means? Total what you mean by total clinical picture? Correct. Well, I think what you're looking at are things that comprise risk factors, so and urgency to action. So you're looking at what is the gestational age of this fetus? What are the maternal risk factors? What are the fetal risk factors? And the reason gestational age is in there, if you'll recall Bill saying, that prematurity has a much more significant um, impact on the ability to withstand stressors. So we're looking at also labor. Is she progressing in labor? What stage of labor is she at? Um, are we using medications such as oxytocin to augment her labor? All of those things compromise the total clinical picture, as well as your own environment. Are you in a rural and remote facility with limited access to services? Are you in a level three, four facility where I work in downtown Hamilton or Toronto, where you've got everybody and their mother on your doorstep? Or is your anesthesia 20 minutes away? Those are part of the environment you look at as well. Bill, you may want to add to that. There are two clinical examples I want to say. A healthy fetus in normal labor, if it develops complicated variables, the, the literature is clear that that baby is probably going to be fine if it's out in an hour. Okay? It doesn't, I mean, depending on the severity of them, of course. And we also know that a prolonged deceleration, that baby, if it's healthy and you know the baby's going to be out, so for example, I mentioned that, is if a woman's progressing, she's had three babies before, she's now fully dilated, the head's descending, and now you've got that prolonged deceleration, stand back and rejoice in the birth because there is not a concern you have to interfere. But if you have that and she's three centimeters dilated, looking at the picture, you must act. Excellent, excellent answer. So here's a question. Uh, I'll try to get one from everybody who's in attendance today, all the areas of expertise, who's a midwife, very experienced, has a question about the subjectiveness of palpating contractions. Her comment is the literature tells us that findings from palpation are subjective and the, care, and the care provider should gather this information by watching the behavior of the mother and her own report of the contraction strength. Comments on that? Absolutely. One of the things that has come up is not only looking at the mother's um, pain tolerance, but her coping mechanism. How is mom coping? Because a woman who has strong contractions but is coping really well may be different from the woman who's not coping at all and is hyperventilating or responding poorly. There's an old nursing trick. I, I'm sure actually it's an old midwifery trick that the strength of your contraction is you feel the end of your nose that's sort of soft, that's a mild, your chin is moderate, and your forehead, which is not indentable, at least for most people, um, is strong. And so those are the very subjective reasons. But as you're palpating contractions, you have a mum bouncing all over the bed in agony, just distressed, you're more likely 
because you're a normal human being, classify that as strong versus the same woman who's breathing normally and coping well, you might class it as moderate. Can I make one comment? Sure. Is that although we can't tell about the strength of the contraction, we can tell with our hands the length of the contraction. And that isn't emphasized enough. So if you have a, a firm uterus that's lasting 60 seconds, you know what? That's probably a pretty good contraction. But if you have a uterus that's only 50, 30 seconds long, that's firm, it may not be. So don't underestimate your ability to tell the length of the contraction. Interesting and good information. All right, next question comes from, it's actually a comment from the plaintiff's lawyer from Toronto. While the new guideline provides some new information to help guide the interpretation of variable decelerations and attempts to weave in the crucial importance of the overall clinical picture, it's my view that this guideline is vague, lacking in medical evidence for many of the recommendations and behind the science in some important respects. Although it's primary about fetal surveillance, the excerpts related to the relationship between newborn neurologic injury and interpartum events is concerning due to omissions and inaccuracy. I feel this guideline needs to be subjected to critical assessment and further amendment before it's widely imp implemented. Comments on that? Uh, I'll, I'll start. Um, okay. I, I mean, I really appreciate those kinds of comments because of course, you know, that's, that reflects the usability of the, of the guideline. Um, I, all you can say is that uh, a couple of things. First of all, the guideline has been vetted past um, all the appropriate organizations, the SOGC, Clinical Practice Guideline Committee, the uh, OC, uh, so a variety of interpersonal and also midwifery and so on. The other thing I'd comment is that anything that's in there is, is in the literature. We've taken the most of the information about predictability of intrapartum events causing uh, fetal harm from the ACOG uh, statement of 2014, which, is, which it isn't entirely consistent with. So we have used um, uh, the information um, on the uh, predictability of intrapartum of harm uh, from that guideline. The third thing I'd comment is that the uh, complicated variables, which is something that has been so ambiguous in, and even in the American, they call them severe variables. Um, all of the, the items that we have listed is, is in the literature, and I, we have references to all of them as being uh, evidence of significant a possible uh, effect to the fetus. And the, the, the one we're saying, the large ones, 60, the rule of 60s, the other one about delayed recovery, the association of overshoots, and then the abnormalities of the company, those variables keep. In other words, a decel or a bradycardia with any kind of uncomplicated variable all make physiologic sense. Um, so I appreciate the comment. And, uh, and uh, all I can say is that the, the most of the, well, we try to think most of it is, is, is referenced. Sharon? I, I just like to add a couple of comments. If we had randomized controlled, placebo controlled trials for every single element of fetal health surveillance, we'd all be blessed and we'd all be saying the same thing. In fact, a lot of the literature around fetal health surveillance is not perfect research evidence. It is the best we have. It's based as well a combination of the trials that we have and the physiology understanding that we have. And there's been some recent very, very good papers on physiology. And those were the basis of what we did. We also, within the guideline, referenced the level of evidence that our recommendations were based on. They are not all primary level one evidence. We know that because that level one evidence does not exist. So you can only work with what you have and provide the best recommendation based on the evidence, describing the strength of the evidence that you're basing it on. Thank you. Any further comments? No. Nope. We're good. All right. The culture on labor and delivery units is sometimes a challenge to, yeah, to nurses, to doctors, and certainly um, cultural issues are sometimes a factor in medical legal lawsuits. You know, how people get along and who listens to who and who comes when they're called. And certainly issues around the use of oxytocin, you know, with the nurses nursing. Anyway, there's lots that we could talk about, but a specific question from today from another experienced perinatal nurse and clinical educator. Her question is, can you recommend any suggestions for changing the culture in a labor and delivery unit 
where obstetricians do not allow for the use of intermittent auscultation, regardless of risk factors. Ah, uh, that's yeah. a tough one. Well, because you go ahead, Sharon. Well, I know of one instance of a facility in Toronto that really the lead to change their triage unit to use IA appropriately came from obstetrics. Yes, a lot of the obstetricians opposed it, but it was an obstetrician who took the lead on that. And you do need a multidisciplinary team, I think, to make those kinds of changes. Nursing can't say this or whatever. And it's very hard because we all have our phones, right? We all have our technology. And even the women that we care for sometimes rely more on technology, feel more reassured on it. And if you're in a teaching unit, often people want that tracing for show and tell to the obstetrician as opposed to just saying what it was. And it's very, very hard to change that culture because of whatever people's past lived experiences have been. You know, all you need to have is a couple of ruptured uteruses on VBACs and you're then very, oh goodness, a VBAC, I'm nervous about it because you've had some experience that has given you caution. Doesn't mean you're making wrong decisions, but it does make you cautious. So that past experience of either a unit or an obstetrician or a nurse will color it. By the same token, there are nurses who revert to e EFM more quickly because they lack their confidence in their IA skills. Can I just add a couple of things? First of all, we all know that one-to-one -one attention from a nurse to a woman who's in labor is very critical and very improves a lot of outcomes. And if that person can do IA uh, and be there with them throughout labor, there are some positive outcomes for that alone. And as Sharon said, is that's almost certainly because the experience there is because of bad experiences with IA in the past. And almost certainly it's because IA wasn't being done properly. One thing that we've tried to emphasize in this guideline is that you can't do IA unless you're doing it properly. And if you're doing it properly, it is effective, it is efficient, and it is safe in low-risk women. But it can't be done by somebody coming in every 15 minutes and listening to the heartbeat. That's not IA. All right. Great answer. And I think with that, we're going to call this done. Um, thank you so much for all of you who attended today. Almost everyone was able to stick around for the entire webinar, which is, which is fantastic. I also want to thank Dr. Bill Eman and Sharon Dorr, co-authors of the SOGC Guideline on Fetal Health Surveillance Number 396, for the gracious sharing of your time and your energy and your expertise. It's just been absolutely fantastic. Once again, this webinar will be recorded and we'll put it up on our the Connect Medical Legal Experts website sometime next month and we'll try to let you know when it gets there. It's now Friday afternoon, almost everywhere across the country, so I hope the weekend ahead has something enjoyable and pleasurable for everyone. Thank you, take good care of yourselves, and goodbye. <laughs>